Hello and a very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is one of the most popular personalities on DWTV. And here she is, the presenter of our Euromax programme, Karin Helmstedt. Hello, it's a pleasure Karin. to be here. Yeah, great to have you here on Talking Germany. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>? you. <laughs> great stuff. Now, although many of you will already know Karin, I wonder just how well you know her. Were you, for instance, aware that she was once an international swimmer or that she is a singer? Now, I've mentioned already that you are the presenter of our Euromax programme, and the job of Euromax is to showcase uh, European culture and style, German culture and style. Mm -hmm. So just tell me, let's begin by you telling us, uh, what is the image of Europe and what is the image of Germany that Euromax presents? I think it tries to concentrate on, on, on the innovative side, the, the up-and-coming side, all the, all the while respecting all of, all of the historical richness, obviously, but uh, it's, it's the good stuff. It's the good the, stuff. Of, the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. The, the reason that, that uh, all the reasons why, the, the off-the-beaten-track stuff, the, the reasons why people want to travel here. Mm -hmm. And you yourself, I think it's fair to say, are a little bit of a, of, of a hybrid. You're, you, you're part North American yes. yeah, and part European. Is that a fair assessment? That is a very fair assessment, actually. I think when I was living in Canada and growing up over there, I always did have a, a very strong feeling of pull towards Europe. I knew that when I got older at some point, uh, I would probably be taking off there. At the time, I probably thought only for one or two years. It's ended mm -hmm. up being about 17, but anyway... And what, so, that, that pull that you felt towards Europe, what was, what was the attraction there? That's a very good question. I think, um, I think as a young person I probably didn't appreciate, uh, you know, the way one often is, one doesn't necessarily appreciate one's own surroundings. I mean, I knew my own surroundings. Um, it's, it's a very big country. It's, it's, um, you can travel a very, very long way before you even get to a town or a city. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of was very attracted by all the oldness in, in Europe, but also all this, uh, I guess, you know, the fact that it was so concentrated. There was so much to see in, in, on such a small surface area, relatively speaking. Great stuff. So. Old Europe, I love it. Now, we've, as we've seen already, Carolyn is a very versatile lady. Karin, let's talk a little bit more about your relationship to Germany. When you, you, were, you were growing up in Canada, but you had a father, your father, who had this mm -hmm. background in East Germany. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he was telling you, when, as you were growing up, an awful lot about Germany. He was probably mm -hmm. telling you about two Germanys, in fact. What did he tell you? Um, I think for us, the, the spectre of the East was always, you know, something that, I mean, he grew up during the war and uh, it was it was very much characterized by things like hunger and and lack and on the other hand um he w was a member of a very large family and and they, they lived in a very very big house with with aunts and uncles and people around to his mother was actually also working parents were both doctors and and um they had there was a lot of life in that house and a lot of a lot of uh Interested, they got up to a lot of mischief, and and so mm. it's 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 interesting. It's sort of a, an interesting old time, but obviously when he was the life, so it, it was a happy as a student. It, it became very difficult. Okay, so it was a happy family background in an unhappy state. I suppose you could put it that way. You'd probably be better asking him that question. Yeah. But when you, you I, I know you told me when you were twelve years old, you mm. then went off for the. It was your first visit to Germany, and as part of that visit, you went to communist East Germany at that we time. We did. We travelled back to visit yeah. members of his family for the very first time, um, and that was yeah, that was a very eye-opening experience. I was. Uh, I think coming from a place like Canada where, where colour and, and, and obviously wealth and, and, and selection in grocery stores was, was a very normal thing. It was, it was, it was difficult and, and different. I think my father was also quite shocked himself at the state of certain places and how, they, how run down they had become. Mm. I mean, in 1980, that was, those mm. were early days. That was Given what we're talking about and your background as you're describing it, it must have been a very important experience or a very special experience for you to take part in DWTV's broadcasting for 20 years of the fall of the, or marking 20 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the and German reunification that followed on, on the back of that. Yeah, just it, tell me about that. Yeah, it was. It was 
very, very interesting. It was almost like having come some sort of strange full circle. I mean, mm -hmm. it is it is obviously a very odd thing. I mean, my father did everything he could to get out of, of Germany, and I think he was very happy to, to at the time, uh, back in the... In the 60s, to, to leave it uh, behind and to just find, follow new horizons. And um, he's no longer a German citizen. He actually mm -hmm. took on Canadian citizenship as quickly as he could. Uh, but I've come back here and, and uh, been able to build up and, and reconnect with a lot of, a lot of the family. And it, it's, it's made for some really interesting stories in the, in the, post, in the post wall years. Mm -hmm. It was all very far away at one point. It's, yeah. it's sometimes very surreal to, mm -hmm. to, to imagine the difference today and mm -hmm. what it was like back in the 80s. That's fascinating stuff. Now, as part of the full circle that Karen's life has, has, has been, as she's just described it, she's, she's made her way up into, as we've already seen, into the upper echelons of swimming, that rarefied upper elite level, which has given her some insights into uh, the whole vexed issue of doping in swimming and in other sports. <laughs> Mm, there's so many questions we could deal with here. First up, were you ever offered banned substances? Never. Never. Mm -hmm. Any of the swimmers that you were swimming with in your team at national level, were they offered banned substances? Not that I know of. Mm -hmm. I know of one who is actually a friend who went and spent some time in California where somebody's father was a pharmacist and they uh -huh. ended up getting something slipped to them on the side and he failed a drug test. Okay. And Let's... was out of the, out of the picture. Okay. I know of other Canadian athletes in other sport disciplines who uh, tested positive and subsequently, obviously there are many of them, okay. but uh, myself never. What, what about your cousin, the East German swimmer? Tell us about that. That was a cousin that was obviously a young boy, a man, a young man that I never knew. Mm -hmm. um, he died in the early 70s. He was the son of a cousin of my father. He, di he died in the early 70s? Yes, he was... Uh, was this linked to... One can assume that it had uh, something to do with it. I mean, he was taken up into the system from from a very young age, and about grade five, and he was a member of one of the one of the sport um, internats, as of boarding schools, mm -hmm. and um, swam for for many years to, to the age of, of seventeen, and was eventually kicked off the team because his performances weren't good enough. And it was during the phase of detraining, uh, upon which time he was left entirely to his own devices. Just explain no what detraining, detraining is Detraining would be to, people. When, when obviously when an athlete is in heavy training, they're training up to 10, 15 kilometers a day, depending on what kind of a, of a, of a swimmer they are, what sort of distance they do. And a detraining situation was what you went into after stopping and desiring to, deciding to retire and you had to actually sort of take your body down slowly um, was the idea that, that this is healthier, obviously, instead of stopping cold turkey. Mm -hmm. um, it was during that phase that he unfortunately died literally on the pool deck, mm -hmm. had a, suffered a massive heart failure and uh, fell into the water and drowned. That's a very, very sad story. And I, it was interesting, while we were watching that report on the problem in general, you were saying how very sad it makes you. And I wasn't sure what you were referring to in particular, but I had the sense that what you were, what you were, what you were thinking was that uh, many sports that we actually spend so much time watching these days mm. have, in a, in a way, lost their credibility and lost their spirit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I find it just so disappointing constantly to be confronted. I mean, there's hardly a day that you open the newspaper here in Germany, obviously based on, on the past in Germany, there's, there's a real will to, um, to get to the bottom of every little doping story. There is a doping story almost every day. Mm. And I find it so disappointing that um, <clears throat> after all of the experiences that I've had with, the, with sport and with my own sport, it's very difficult to be as enthusiastic about it as I once was. And, and um, it's, it's, I really don't know if my children wanted to become high performance athletes of their own volition, I would support it, but I certainly wouldn't push them in that direction. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty tough ride. That's interesting that Karen is talking about children there because we're going to be talking about children now. I suppose uh, the bottom line on this kind of story is it's all about respecting your body, but that is not an easy thing to do for many youngsters these days. After all, they grow up in what I think it's fair to say is very much a fast food culture. Uh, many don't get much of a sense of what healthy nutrition is all about. And here in Germany, one in six, I'm told, one in six is overweight. Is that how your uh, children react to uh, fruit and vegetables? Salad? Absolutely not. No. 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 So what? What, are, what have you got right? I really don't. I, I think what. 
what, what I feel when I look at, the, at a report like that is just how lucky I was, how lucky I was to have a mother who was home and, and not only an excellent cook herself, but a very adventurous cook mm -hmm. and somebody who confronted us with, we traveled obviously as, mm -hmm. as children and as a family and we were confronted with many, many different kinds of, of food at a very early age. Yeah. Uh, not as early as my children, obviously there are things today that they get confronted with at, at ages two and three and I didn't taste certain things until I was maybe 25, but, but um, we learned very early um, or we were able to develop our palate, which I think is also an extremely important point for, for you kids. You developed your palate, yeah? Very important. Carden, I, can, I, I must say that that is a statement from somebody from a sort of a, a good middle-class home. And no, they, it's, a it brings me... <laughs> it's a statement from someone who lived in France, where we talk about, okay, okay. il faut développer le palais. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. le palais est très important <laughs> pour... Pouvoir, uh, <laughs> to be able to enjoy your into, food. We could do the interview in French. French. Yeah, yeah. We spoke but, about that. No, but tell me this. Here in Germany, there's a really serious edge to this story. Germany is increasingly becoming a wee little bit of a divided society. People mm -hmm. are increasingly saying that there are the haves, and not quite the have-nots, but the far the less well-off. So Germany used to be a much more egalitarian society. This eating business, this problem of kids having yeah. the kind of problems we saw in the report, mm. that's a class phenomenon. Yes or no? I agree. Yeah. I think there's a major problem. Food is expensive. Good food is expensive. Good point, yeah. And to be able to have access to the good food and to provide mm -hmm. your children with, with, with fresh produce as opposed to produce that's, that's been canned or, or dried or desiccated and powdered, um, not everybody has, has the means or, or the time to then actually, or the know-how mm -hmm. to deal with raw ingredients. Um, it's something that, that you really do have to learn. There you go. Karen has explained, I think, the core of the issue there for us. Um, we're going to talk now a little bit. We've been talking about um, German, Germany, Canada. We've even been to France and had Karen speaking French. Let's talk about Germany now. One of the <laughs> things that many, she's laughing now, <laughs> what, what, one thing that many visitors have in their heads when they come here to Germany is uh, an image of woods, castles and rivers. It's, it, in short, I suppose, something that is a mixture of German romanticism and romantic Germany. Here's what I mean. Neuschwanstein Castle, Heidelberg, and the picturesque Rhine Valley. In 2009, over 24 million foreign tourists visited Germany to enjoy sites like these. Many of them come to sample for themselves the legacy of the legendary German Romanticism, the dominant movement in Germany in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The movement's aesthetic was defined largely by romantic artists such as Caspar David Friedrich and Philipp Otto Runge. To some extent, romanticism was a reaction to industrialization. Cities began to spill into the countryside, threatening nature. The romantics revolted against the Enlightenment and its scientific rationalization of nature. To them, untamed nature was almost holy. They prized intuition and emotion. Romanticism found expression in the visual arts, music and literature, as well as education and natural history. Its proponents included composers and writers such as Richard Wagner, Friedrich Hölderlin, Robert Schumann and the Brothers Grimm. Their famous fairy tales were an antidote to the increasingly industrialized world of the 19th century. Romanticism looked beyond classicist ideals and instead glorified a revived medievalism. The Romantics believed that emotion was more valid than reason. Their work was steeped in melancholy and yearning. One of the seminal literary works of Romanticism was Goethe's Sturm und Drang novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. So what exactly is the legacy of Romanticism? Nature is still at the heart of German identity. The German forest myth is still very much at the heart of German culture. Environmental protection is one of the country's top priorities. Even today, melancholy and yearning continue to be quintessentially German. But although millions of tourists visit Germany to admire its romantic heritage, Germans themselves spend more money than anyone else in the world on holidays abroad.
Karen was laughing, a common German and a Canadian theme, nature. Karen, are you a romantic spirit? Yes. How does that express itself? Ah. Uh, uh, you write romantic fact, poems. You're, you you are a poetess. Po I write poetry. I write songs. I, I love to actually feel feel these melancholy things i love melancholy okay. music i love i love to sort of explore what's the most different emotions what's the most romantic town in germany oh that i've been to that you've been to goodness gracious that's a difficult question come on the viewers need to go dresden dresden Oh, I love Dresden. I love yeah. Dresden. Have you been up? The, have you been down the Rhine? You've done the the the, the river I've journey down the Rhine. I've seen the Lorelei. She was one of our Lorelei? first destinations. Have you been to Neuschwanstein Castle? Nein. No. You've got to go. Yeah. Could you imagine? Absolutely. Could you imagine? Many, you, many Karl many Could you imagine yourself living in a castle with turrets and what have you? Too much cleaning. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> Too cold. <laughs> Too cold. Yeah. Um, do Germans really read Goethe? Yes, I think they do, but uh, Goethe's. Good is um, something that I think you read at particular stages of your life, when you're in school and then probably later when you've learned to appreciate it. So you've, you've learned Goethe too? You've read Goethe? I have read some Goethe, She's yes. She's read Goethe. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to move on to our, uh, our quick quiz at the end of the show. I okay. know you were looking forward to the quiz. <laughs> Swimming or singing? Singing. Two iconic Canadian singers for you to choose from, Neil Young or Joni Mitchell? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Cohen. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> you've, uh, you've outed yourself as a poetess uh, when you're writing poetry. Rhyming couplets or open verse? Open verse. Open verse, yeah. Fruit and vegetables or meat and potatoes? Fruit and vegetables. Fresh or frozen? Fresh. The Alps or the Rhineland? The Alps. Lovely. Thank you, Karen, for coming and joining us today Thank on you Talking Germany. You've been a great guest. She's our one, our own, and our one and only Karen Helmstedt. If you've enjoyed her company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye bye, and as they say here in Germany, tschüss. <laughs>